name is Negin Golrezai. I'm an assistant professor at MIT Sloan School of Management. And today I'm going to talk about auction design for ROI constraints by it. This is a joint work with Ilan Lobel from NYU and Renato Paislin from Google. So to set the stage, let me first talk about second price auction. Second price auction are the key building block of digital ad markets. Second price auction are everywhere because under this auction format, being truthful is a dominant strategy. But there's a catch. Second price auctions are truthful if buyers are quasi-linear. Quasi-linearity means that buyer's utility is equal to their valuation minus their payment. And this assumption seems like a harmless assumption, but is it really the case? If you think about quasi-linearity assumption, this assumption means that buyers measure their utility in monetary units. But if buyers have financial constraint, this assumption is going to break down. And in fact, there are papers in the literature that shows that second price auction are not truthful if buyers are financially constrained. In the equilibrium, buyers should shade their bids, meaning that they should they will submit a bid less than their valuation. And in fact, because of that, several many papers study financial constraint in the literature. And here I'm providing very limited sample. One of the main takeaway message of the literature is that auction designers should take into account financial constraint because that constraint significantly influence the structure of the auctions and of optimal auctions or optimal mechanism. Another takeaway message is that when you look at that problem and you want to identify the optimal mechanism under the case that when both valuation and budget are private, things become too complicated and it's become too complicated in a sense that you may, you may even lose the main intuition behind the underlying optimal mechanism. But there is, there is one particular thing that I really want to highlight from the literature. And that's the fact that there is very little empirical evidence for or against financial constraints in the ad markets. There is this paper by uh, Orbach et al. 2008 that they show some evidence of return on investment targeting in Yahoo search data. But beside that, uh, to the best of our knowledge, there, there is no other work that look at uh, finding empirical evidence for this financial constraint and in particular even from for the theoretical result the uh, ROI constraint has not been studied in the literature. So in this work we propose a framework for auction design under return on investment constraint. Under this framework we identify financially constrained behavior in data from field experiment run by Google and we show that how we can optimize a mechanism for ROI constrained buyers and at the end, we do, find, uh, we do perform counterfactual analysis to understand the impact of considering ROI constraint in the design of a mechanism. Okay, now let's, let's look at the model. Our model is quite simple. There are N buyers. Each buyer has some valuation VI, which is drawn from regular distribution F of I. Buyers have uh, some target ROIs, gamma I, which are common knowledge. And that's the fact that if you consider private one, the problem become technically very challenging and maybe the main insight uh, may get lost by considering very complex model. Buyers have quasi-linear utilities only uh, if, if they achieve their target ROI. And uh, when it comes to participation, buyers are going to participate if their expected ROI is greater than some the target ROI that they have in mind. So moving forward, in this talk, I'm just going to focus on Drake mechanism, and that's without the loss of generality by the revelation principle. But I'm not only going to focus on incentive compatible mechanism, because in this work, we also study second price auction. And we know for the fact that um, in the second price auction, when we have ROI constraint, buyers may not be truthful, at, um, truthful and then the mechanism that we have is going to be non-incentive compatible. Okay. Now, when it comes to designing a mechanism, by, we can only uh, choose this allocation and payment rule Q and P. And let's say that every buyer is going to have a strategy sigma i that maps his valuation or his type 
uh, to his reported time. And um, then given this strategy, we are going to have this QI of sigma minus i and PI of sigma minus i to represent buyers in trim allocation and payment. So Q here is the expected probability that the buyer I gets the uh, um, gets the item on, uh, uh, when the buyer follows this particular strategy. Then I'm going to define these buyers on adjusted utility, where the buyers on adjusted utility is just simply the buyer's quasi-linear utility is going to be his valuation times the probability that he gets the item minus his payment. And now let's get to the important part where we define the buyer's return on investment. The buyer's return on investment under this strategy sigma is going to be equal to the expected unadjusted utility that the buyer gets divided uh, by the expected payment that the buyer has to pay. Okay, so and it's obvious from the kind of the definite the, the name of the return on investment. So think about the UI as the return and think about the PI as the amount that the buyer invests. So this ratio then it's become the buyer's return on investment. Now, since we define the uh, buyer's ROI, now I can define buyer adjusted utility, where the buyer's adjusted utility is just simply equal to the buyer on adjusted utility, which, is, which was this quasi-linear utility, if the buyer's return on investment is greater than his target ROI, which is this gamma i, and if his target ROI is less than gamma i, buyer adjusted utility is going to be negative infinity and that would imply that the buyers would not participate in that case. Now we say that strategy profile sigma is a Bayesian Nash equilibrium if no buyer wants to deviate from that strategy if all other buyers follow the same the strategy sigma minus i. Okay? And that's again consistent this notion of Bayesian Nash equilibrium that we have is consistent with the typical or traditional way of defining Bayesian Nash equilibrium in the mechanism design literature. Okay, now uh, here uh, first I'm going to focus on second price auction. Uh, we, we want to understand how buyers that they have return on investment constraint react and response uh, in second price auction. Suppose that I'm running a simple second price auction with reserve and then in our theorem we say there are going to exist two thresholds gamma i underline and gamma i bar such that the buyer's best response is given as follows. If the buyer target ROI is pretty small, is less than gamma i underline, so buyers be truthfully. So, so far so good. If the gamma i is uh, something in between, between these two thresholds, the buyer is going to shade his bid and is going to submit a, a bid which is going to be some beta i which is shading factor times his true valuation. And if the buyer's target ROI is greater than uh, the other the gamma i bar, the buyer does not participate in the second price auction at all. Okay. So we have another result uh, for the second price auction. And instead of like me representing that result, I'm just going to explain that result via this figure. So that result investigate how buyer's reaction would change if I'm increasing the reserve price for in the second price auction. So and then the, the result explained that as I'm increasing the reserve price, buyers tend to submit lower uh, lower bid. In, in other words, the shading factor is going to get smaller. So now let's look at these figures. Here you see that the bid distribution and here is the probability density of the submitted bids under two different reserve price. You will see that as I'm increasing the reserve price, uh, which is this um, purple line, the bid distribution under this higher reserve price is become dominated by the bid distribution under lower reserve price. And that, in other words, the buyers tend to submit a lower bid when we increase their reserve price. Now, uh, we, we have this theoretical result. We wanted to uh, look at the experimental data that we had from Google to, to see if we can confirm our theoretical result. And in that experiment and in that data set we had from Google, uh, we, had a, we, we could look at this field experiment. In the field experiment, queries were randomized to receive either standard as a price, which was the control group, or in, uh, or they see like a slightly higher reserve price, which was the treatment uh, group. And then when I'm saying a slightly, it's just around like one to four percent. 
that wasn't something that we designed uh, that was something that the google was running and then we only look at the result of the experiment to verify our um, our theoretical findings and uh, in our analysis we focus on the on the performance buyers uh, where the example of the performance buyers are this retargeting advertiser or mobile ad advertisers and uh, and in fact this type of advertisers um, are kind of like a big group and in particular in our data set when we look at the largest 200 buyers with the uh, the highest amount of spending we find out that 35 of them are clearly performance buyers and now we looked at their behavior or the shading behavior of the performance buyer in that experiment that we had across multiple days here you see day one and day two and here's the average shading factor so shading factor if it's one it means that the bidding behavior did not change when you go from the lower reserve price to higher reserve price but one thing we see that when we are increasing the reserve price the, the shading factor actually become less than one and that highlights that by increasing the reserve price the these performance buyers tend to submit lower bids which is consistent with our theoretical result we also look at the bid distribution to see that if we can confirm our theoretical finding so here is the red one is the bid distribution under the treatment higher reserve price and the blue one is the bid distribution under the control group uh, lower reserve price so we see the same thing the bid distribution under the treatment group is being dominated by the bid distribution under the control group where the reserve price is lower which means that as i'm increasing the reserve price buyers tend to lower their bid and remember that was what we expected uh, from our model and the result I just show you is consistent with what we expected from the uh, from the model okay so given this result then we ask ourselves what can we do so certainly we don't want to run a second price auction uh, because it seems like the buyers have this kind of bad reaction to increase the reserve price so then in this theorem we characterize the optimal mechanism and we first look at the case when the, all the buyers are symmetric uh, we show that when the buyers are symmetric, the same target ROI and the same valuation distribution, there are going to exist some gamma L, gamma H, and some uh, value S, and a function R, such that the following mechanism is revenue optimal. If the target ROI is less than gamma L, then in the optimal mechanism, we just simply run a second price auction with the monopoly reserve price. So meaning that nothing is going to change the same op mechanism that was optimal before, now is also optimal. If the target ROI is between gamma oil and gamma H, we need to run a second price auction, but with a reserve price which is less than the monopoly reserve price. And if the gamma oil is greater than gamma H, we need to run a second price auction with, without any reserve price at all. And in addition, we may also provide a subsidy S to each buyer to make sure that the, buyer, uh, the buyers participate in the auction. And in the optimal mechanism, the mechanism is designed in a way that every buyer participate in the auction. So with asymmetric buyers, the structure of the optimal mechanism become a bit uh, more complex. Uh, we need to have this Lagrangian multiplier associated with the ROI constraint of every buyer. And in the optimal mechanism, we allocate the item to a buyer with the highest non-negative adjusted virtual value, where this adjusted virtual value is function of this Lagrangian multiplier associated with the ROI constraint. Okay, so then, since we have characterized the optimal mechanism, we went back to data and we asked ourselves, are we going to see any significant improvement in revenue and welfare? Um, if we switch from the second price auction with the monopoly reserve price, which is optimal when you don't have a right constraint to the optimal mechanism that we characterize. So here, uh, let's focus on the, these two figures because the other two is kind of similar. So we observe that under this lake, when you are going to the using our optimal mechanism, both revenue and welfare increases. And in fact, the increase in revenue and welfare uh, is higher when the market is thinner and the number of buyers is smaller. And which is, I think, great thing. Usually in the mechanism design the literature, when you are thinking about like improving revenue, the welfare hurts. But here we can see that there is a win-win situation. A buyer uh, can get a higher welfare and uh, the ad exchange is also can earn more revenue. So let me summarize. Here we, in this work, we develop a theory of auction design under ROI constraint. 
We show empirically that the setup buyers, these performance buyers, appear to have ROI constraints. They tend to shake their bids when we increase the reserve price. And then we look at the optimal mechanism. And one of the nice takeaway message of this work is that when we have ROI constraint as a seller, we should treat the buyers nicer. We should reduce reserve prices for them. And then we sometimes need to provide subsidy for them. Otherwise, if we don't do that, they are not going to even participate in the auction. And then in that scenario, our revenue is going to hurt as well. And in other words, if you go with our optimal mechanism, there will be gain in both revenue and welfare. And that gain can be potentially large. Thank you so much for listening to my talk. Um, and then I would be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you.